I know that uh, two weeks ago we started a series together on when they followed him being a disciple. And I know that Pastor Mike shared with you guys in that first week the difference between being a disciple and being a believer. You see that churches are full of believers. But they're not full of disciples. And our, our church is not called to be full of believers. We're, we're called to be full of disciples. And talked about what is the difference between a, a believer and a disciple. Well, very simply, a believer believes. A believer has made a decision, a faith decision. I believe. That's wonderful. They've accepted the greatest gift ever offered. The Son of God as a sacrifice for their sins. And they believe that and accept that. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. That's what makes a believer. But God wants more than our belief. He wants more than a faith statement. He wants more than something that we just meant with our heart and said with our mouths. He wants to make believers disciples. And here's the difference. A disciple is someone who gladly allows the ministry and life of Jesus to replace their own. But it'll be, it'll be just right. A disciple is right. someone who gladly allows the ministry and life of Jesus Christ to replace their own. It is Him through us. It is Him in us. And it is Him instead of us. That's what makes a disciple. Also know that in that first week, you were reminded that believers cannot fulfill the Great Commission. A believer cannot fulfill the Great Commission. Look at what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. These are the words of Christ. Jesus says, Therefore, He's speaking to those that He is leaving now. He's ascending up to heaven. Therefore, go and make disciples. Say that with me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You see, here's the thing, folks. The church has been commissioned to make disciples. And only disciples can make disciples. Only disciples can make disciples. Jesus did not say, go and make believers. He didn't say it. He didn't say, go and make church members. Go and make people who pray. Go and make people who sing. He said, go and make disciples. Our directive is clear. We must be disciples making disciples disciples. Last week, I know Pastor Chris shared with you guys about the cost of being a disciple. Disciples have to deny themselves. Disciples have to put Christ in a position that they have long held. First place. A disciple relinquishes the title of being first. And a disciple gladly steps to the side, denies themselves, and allows Christ to have a preeminent position where He belongs. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 16, 24 and 25. Then Jesus said to His who? Disciples. If any of you wants to be My follower, you must turn from your selfish ways. Take up your cross and follow Me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for My sake, you will save it. There's a sacrifice that comes with being a disciple. There is a cost, folks, to being a disciple. And there is certainly a cost to being a disciple who makes disciples. That's what I want to start with today with you guys. Talking about this. What is the ministry of a disciple? You've told me what a disciple is. So someone who allows Christ to have the position, the helm in their heart. So someone who says, I want His life and His ministry 
And, and I want my old life removed so that it can be replaced with his own. If that is what a disciple is, and if, and if I know that you, you've told me it requires sacrifice, it, there's a cost to this. But what do I do? How do I disciple? Not just how do I become a disciple, but how do I be a disciple who makes disciples? Because here's the thing. We're, we're great at getting personally convicted. That message spoke to my heart. God used that scripture and the power of His Spirit to move me to a point of repentance. I don't just want to be a believer. I want to be a disciple. And there's so many people in this sanctuary that have over the last few weeks come to that decision. I don't just want to be a believer. I want to be what He has saved me to be. I want to be conformed into the image of Christ. I want to be a follower, not just a believer. I want to be a disciple, not just someone who has faith. So tell me, what do I do? Well, I want to tell you about your ministry. If you're up for this, and it's a decision you've got to make, if you're up for being a disciple who makes disciples, this is your ministry. I love this passage of Scripture. We're going to walk through it today together. It's out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. This is your ministry. This is your ministry. If you are willing to accept the calling of a disciple. The Bible says this. And all of this is a gift from God. Who brought us back to Himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to Him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making His appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, Come back to God. This is the ministry of a disciple. No matter how old you are, whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're married or single, whether you're a business owner or whether you've got four jobs, whether you live in the big house or the shack, whether you've got one car or 15, whether you've got a bunch of money in the bank or live paycheck to paycheck. Our ministry is the same. You and I have been given the ministry of reconciliation. You and I have been tasked with the opportunity to call others to be reconciled to God. There's no greater calling there, there's no greater function. There's no greater program. There's no greater message than this one. You have been chosen as a believer to become a disciple who makes disciples by calling others to come to the one that you are following. That is your job as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, go on to all the world. Sometimes we hear that and we, we almost turn that verse into a scapegoat. Well, I'm not going to another country, so that, that doesn't apply to me. Or, well, I'm not a preacher, so that doesn't apply to me. Or, well, I'm not involved in this big ministry, so that doesn't apply to me. But I'm telling you, folks, if you have made a decision to accept and follow Christ, it applies to you. This applies to you. Because when he said go unto all the world, you know who he was talking about? The people you're going to see when you leave here. You know who he was talking about? The people that you're going to go to work with tomorrow. You know who he was talking about? Your family members. Parents, you know who he was talking about? Your children. Grandparents, you know who he was talking about? Your grandchildren. And your great-grandchildren. And your nieces and your nephews. He was talking about our friends. 
This is for us, folks. This is for you. You got to stop passing the baton to someone else. You got to stop thinking that someone else is going to do it because they can do it better. You've got to stop expecting a pastor or a preacher to do what God has called and commanded and saved you to do. We, we have got to become active in our role as disciples of Jesus Christ. And disciples make disciples. We've gotten so very used to this notion that people only get saved and only get discipled in church. That is not true. That is a lie. It's a lie of religion. It's a lie of tradition. And to be honest with you, it's a lie of laziness. I can just do my thing as long as I'm supporting other people in ministry. I can just do my thing as long as I'm showing up. I, I can kind of do my thing over here as long as I'm, I'm putting something in the offering plate. I can do my thing as long as I support the pastor and others, right? I could just keep doing my thing. No, no, no. No, he's, he's commanded all of us to do this. And can I tell you, it's not as hard as you think. Making disciples is not as hard as you think. It requires three things. And that's what we're going to look at next. Verse by verse, it requires three things. So I want you to write this word down. Ready? Start. Start the conversation. If you are going to be a disciple who makes disciples, the very first thing you're going to have to do is start the conversation. If it's a family member, start the conversation. If it's a co-worker, you've got to start the conversation. If it's a friend, it's on you to start the conversation. Look at what verse 18 says for our example. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to Himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to Him. So first of all, God set the example. He said, I am going to start the conversation with you. I want you, and so I'm going to start this thing with you, and I'm going to give my son for you so that I can have you. You did not start the conversation with God. You didn't do it. God started the conversation with you 2,000 years ago when He put His Son in your place. He started this conversation. I want you, and so I'm going to make a sacrifice for you so that I can have you. If you are going to disciple people, you're going to have to start the conversation. You're going to have to see eternity in somebody. You don't have to see it in everybody all of a sudden because that's tough to do, but you can start seeing eternity in one person. You can see eternity in one of your co-workers. You can see eternity in one of your family members. You can see eternity in one of your friends. And what does that mean? I see them as not just being a friend or a family member or a co-worker, but I see them as spending eternity in one of two places. Heaven or hell. I am going to start the conversation with them because I know that eternity is a long time. And I want them to be with me. I am going to take the initiative and start the conversation with this person. How could we think that it would make sense to wait on someone far from God to ask us about it? We're walking around and if somebody asks us, we're willing to engage in conversation. And that's why it doesn't happen very often. They're not going to ask you. It's not their job to ask you. It is your job as a disciple to start the conversation with them. We're talking about one person, folks. Can I just tell you quickly that Jesus preached to thousands, sure. But He only discipled twelve. There were a few others. There were some ladies present. We'd certainly consider them disciples. He spent the majority of His time just with three of those guys, Peter, James, and John. Jesus didn't try to do it all at once. He gave us an example to follow. Find somebody. Find somebody that you can see eternity in. Their life matters forever. And so I'm going to start this conversation with them. God started it with me. I'm following His example. I'm going to start the conversation with them. You can do this. The second thing that you're going to have to do is be patient. Verse 19 tells us about God's patience with us. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. 
And He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. Now, I want us to read through that verse again. And I want you to try and find the patience of God here. Are you ready? For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. Do you see the patience there? Do you know what you and I get hung up on all the time? Not necessarily our own sin, but the sins of others. Not our own faults, not our planks, but the specks in other people's lives. The sins in their lives, the things that are wrong with them. You're not going to be able to disciple people if your focus is on their sin. Listen to me, this is important. You're not going to be able to disciple people if your focus is on their sin. God's focus was not on our sin. Listen, God's focus when He put Christ on earth to the cross was not on our sin. You ready? It was on us. God loved us in spite of us. God wanted us in spite of all the hang-ups. God wanted us in spite of all the times that He knew we'd let Him down. God wanted me in spite of all the times that I have blown it big time. Big time. God did not let my sin keep Him from pursuing me. You cannot let the hang-ups in someone's life keep you from pursuing them for Christ. Because here's the thing. You're going to pick out this person. You're going to get excited because this message has been preached. And if you're a believer, it's hitting home. And the Holy Spirit of God is saying, you got to do this. you got to do this. you got to do this. You're going to leave here with somebody in mind because that's what the invitation is going to be. Who's that going to be? You're going to leave here. You're going to be ready to start that conversation. Next time you see them, you will start the conversation. Things are going to go well. You're going to feel like, you're, man, this is, this is working. This is working. And then all of a sudden, you want to know what's going to happen? They're going to show you who they really are. They're going to get vulnerable with you. Or they're going to go back to their old ways. Or they're going to blow it big time. And then you're going to have a choice to make. Am I going to forsake them now because of their sin? Or am I going to be patient with them as God has been patient with I have experienced this person in my own ministry. I'm like, all right, God, this is my guy. This is the one I'm going to disciple. I've done this several times. I'm ashamed to say that it's actually happened more than once. This is this is my guy, God. I know this is the one you're leading me to. And I start pouring into him and pouring into him and spending time with him and meeting with him and praying with him and talking with him and texting with him, do, doing doing whatever it takes. And then they blow it. And you know what? I make the foolish decision of letting them let me down. I let them let me down. And I base my reaction on their mistake. How foolish. I'm so thankful God does not treat us that way. God does not base His reaction on your mistake. God bases His reaction to you, everything He does for you, on the perfect and finished work of Jesus Christ. His love for you is not based on your goodness for Him. It's based on Jesus. That's the example I'm supposed to follow. That's the example that you're supposed to follow. We get let down. I see heads nodding. We get let down, don't we? Yes, we do. And and we feel like, well, I'm just going to be done with them. Be patient with them. Be patient with them. Just as someone somewhere was patient with you. Just as God has long been patient with you. Be patient with them. Discipling people is not easy. It takes time. They're not going to get it overnight. I didn't. You didn't. Some of you are just now being discipled because God brought you here. You've never been discipled. You've you've never had an opportunity to to really form relationships and and have other people, more mature Christians, 
pouring into you. You've never had it. Now that you're here, you're, you're seeing what that looks like. And, and you've got to replicate that outside of this place because everybody's not going to come to church here. But everybody needs what you're getting here. So you're going to have to take it to them. And you're going to have to start making sacrifices and investing and initiating the conversation and bringing up tough stuff. You're going to have to do all of that. And they're going to mess it up. They're going to blow it. And then you've got to make a decision. Am I going to persevere? Am I going to be patient with this person and keep on showing them what others have shown to me and what God has surely given to me? Or am I going to let them go and go try somebody else? Real quick example. Just look at the relationship that Jesus had with Peter. Just look at the relationship that those two had. So many different times, Peter just blew it. I mean, Peter just, he was saying stuff that, you know, what were you thinking, dude? Right? Over and over, multiple times. And that's not in Scripture by accident. That's there so that God can show us the patience that He has with people. And look at how Christ restored him before he left. Christ restored him to himself, and then he restored him to his ministry. He said, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. That's the patience you and I are going to have to exhibit with people if we're going to disciple them. The last thing is this. Let's look at verse 20. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making His appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. The third thing it's going to take for you to be a disciple maker is you're going to have to enjoy every opportunity. Enjoy every opportunity. We've got to have a paradigm shift in our Christian mind. That reaching people for Jesus is not a chore. It's not laborious. It's not something to be shunned. It is the greatest opportunity you and I will ever have on planet earth. Is to share the joy of Jesus with others. There's nothing greater. Let me tell you something. Whatever you make and put in your bank account is insignificant compared to discipling one person. However big your house is, however nice your cars are, they are insignificant compared to discipling one person. Not three people, not twelve people. In eternity, one person matters more than everything you'll ever own. Jesus didn't die for your house. He didn't die for your job. He didn't die for your car. He didn't die for your hobbies. He died for you. He died for you. You matter more than all of the treasure of the earth. Just you. You disciple one person. And there's a greater reward in heaven for you than you will ever reap on this earth. Just one. You should enjoy that opportunity. What should motivate the disciple is another opportunity to disciple. That's, that should be our motivation. God, you mean I get to do this again? God, you mean that you're going to let me do this with someone else that might be even worse off than the last person was when I first got to them? Lord, do you mean that you're going to let me disciple someone who's addicted to drugs? God, do you mean that you're going to send me to someone who's an alcoholic? God, are you telling me that you're going to send me to someone that doesn't look like me? Oh, and in His grace, He says, if you're willing, I will. If you're willing, I'd love to send you to someone that looks different than you, that lives in maybe not so quite a, as nice a place as you. Someone that doesn't have what you've had. If, if you're willing, yeah, I'd like for you to disciple them. Grandparents. What I call the Spoilers. Grandparents are the spoilers. You know you are. (laughs) Right? Listen to me. Let me just talk to your heart for a minute, grandparents. You have the honor of discipling 
your grandchildren. You have the honor not just of praying with them, and, and I'm not just talking about seeing them come to Christ in salvation. You have the honor of walking through this life with them as a disciple, making them a disciple. That's an honor, grandparents. That doesn't come second to showing up at their ball game. That doesn't come second to buying them something at Christmas. There's nothing greater that you will accomplish than discipling your grandchildren. Parents, moms, dads, nothing that you do will be more important than you discipling your kids. The most important ministry that I have is at my house. Discipling my children. And the Bible says that if I cannot care for my own household, I have no business trying to care for the house of God. Dads, it's time for you to stop passing the ball to mom. It's time for you to step up and disciple your children. I promise you, God will accept no excuse. On my life, I promise you, He will accept no excuse. Moms, it is time for you to step up and disciple your children. We say we love them. If we truly love them, we will disciple them. Teach a kid how to play sports. You can disciple them during that. <laughs> Teach a kid how to make something. You can disciple them during that. Teach a kid to, to do good in their studies. You can disciple them. It just means that you're going to have to put Jesus first and whatever else you're doing second. And you'll disciple them. And they'll be able to catch the ball without getting hit in the nose. It's a win-win. Disciple your children. Now those of you who say, I'm not a parent, I'm not a grandparent. Good, this is for you. There is someone in your life that you need to disciple. There's someone that God has placed around you that you need to disciple. And God will accept no excuse for your refusal to do it. Now He loves you, but He's not going to overlook your abject resistance to His greatest command. Go unto all the world and make disciples. He's not going to overlook that. That's His directive for us. We have to submit to that directive. There's someone in your life that you need to disciple. Now, if you were in their shoes and they were here in your shoes, I'd be telling them to go to you. But you're the one here. And that means you're the one that God wants to use to disciple them. It's the greatest opportunity you'll ever have. Go back to verse 20. I want you to see just how great this is. First of all, it says that we are Christ's ambassadors. Did you know that the word ambassador means an official representative? An accredited representative. That means that God has officially accredited you as His ambassador. Then it says that God is making His appeal through us. You're His vessel. You should enjoy the fact that God is willing to use you your vessel to disciple someone else. And then it says, we speak for Christ when we plead come back to God. Do you understand what that means? You are the mouthpiece of God when you disciple someone. When you fulfill your role as a reconciler from someone lost to a God who wants to see them saved. When you take your place in that ministry, you are the mouthpiece of God. You ought to enjoy that. There's nothing greater than that. 
And I want you to accept it. I want you to surrender to that. I'm surrendered to that. I'm going to disciple my children. Alongside of my wife. But I'm going to disciple her too. I'm going to disciple one, two, three people at a time. I'm going to invest in them. I'm going to spend time pouring into them when I could spend it doing something else. Because whatever else I might choose is not nearly as rewarding as discipling someone. I want you to make that decision. Our our church, our mission statement is get equipped. That's what we're doing in here, folks. Every time we meet, we're equipping you. Whether it's Sunday morning Sunday school, Sunday morning worship, Wednesday night day groups, we're equipping you. Then we've got to make disciples. We take this equipping and we put it to use. We go, we go from believers to disciples and from disciples to those who make disciples. And then the last part of our mission statement is change the world. You disciples... when I promise you, you have changed the world.